Hi, this is Robert Sungenis coming to you again for another hour of questions and answers. And today is September the 18th, 7 o'clock p.m. I've set aside this time twice a week to uh, come into your home, wherever you may be, to visit my home, as you can see behind you. This is my office, my library, uh, where it all happens, so to speak. And I'm here to share with you uh, my expertise, my understandings, my work, whatever, to help you uh, answer questions regarding the Bible, Catholic theology, um, you know, whatever along those lines. Uh, we've had some great sessions uh, the past month or so that we've done this, and um, hopefully we can continue to do it. And um, I'm just going to get right into it tonight. So uh, let's see if we have some questions over on the question box here. Okay, so uh, Ben. Hi, Ben. How are you? Uh, ben says, hello, Robert. What are your thoughts on women being allowed to vote? prior to the passage of the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution in 1920, there, there were several states in America that did not allow women to vote. Has the Catholic Church ever addressed the question of women's suffrage? Thank you for all your great work that you do. May God richly bless you. Okay. All right. So we're getting into a little political arena here, uh, Ben, a little outside of the... Uh, normal theological biblical uh, areas that we cover um, <clears throat> the the issue to vote with women um, you know I really have to plead ignorance on that one because I haven't really studied the issue that much so um, <clears throat> as far as the Catholic Church um, having any say about women's vote I don't think there has ever been a, uh, a document written on that subject, to, to my knowledge. I've never come across one. So um, I think the church is neutral on that issue as well. Uh, but let's discuss it, you know, uh, because it is part of, as you say, the women's suffrage movement. Um, that term, women's suffrage, is a lot broader than just allowing women to vote. Uh, personally, I don't have a problem with women voting because voting is a, an exercise of the, of the intellect and the will of voicing your choice for uh, someone in office. And if an individual, whether it's a woman or a man, has um, reasons for why they want someone in office and not someone else, uh, those reasons can be very legitimate. <clears throat> and there's no reason as a citizen of the United States where they can't, where they wouldn't have the opportunity to express that, especially in a land where it's considered a right a human right to vote and to say that women can't vote would make them you know uh, not ipso facto but I think it would suggest that you know women are not citizens full-fledged citizens uh, nor are they full-fledged humans in the sense uh, the same sense so uh, in, in along those lines if a discussion were ever to come up, I think the church would raise those issues of, you know, it's a basic human right to be able to choose, um, if not, if you're not imposing your authority on anyone, you're not running for office. Now, that's a whole different story, okay? So if your question had asked, is it right for women to run for office, then I would give a totally different answer. I would say no, okay? And that is because, um, and while we're getting on the subject, let's, let's just dive into it. Um, 
in Scripture and in the Fathers and in the teaching of the church, as we said last night, a woman is supposed to be submissive to the man. And there are three areas in which this would be true. And the Bible covers these areas, okay? And, and the church does also. And those areas are, one, the family. That's the basic unit. And in that area, uh, it, you know, our, our religious teaching is crystal clear that a woman is not to be in authority. Okay, I could give you all the passages. I think you probably know them. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 to 14. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 to 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 1 to 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Colossians chapter 2. And Ephesians chapter 5. So you basically have five passages. Ephesians chapter 5 is actually the longest one. Uh, that goes from verse 22 to 33. And, uh, you know, again, it's crystal clear that women are not to be an authority in the family, but that also applies to the church, okay? That's why we don't have women priests uh, or women bishops or a woman pope. Uh, that would be strictly forbidden under the, under the uh, teaching of the Bible. And if somebody just came in the door, now they're out. Um, uh, so you have those two areas, okay, family and church, and naturally it would flow from those that women do not have authority in the government, okay, because if they have authority in the government, then they would be basically having authority over men, which is forbidden. Uh, so in all three areas, it, it would be, you know, it would be kind of incongruous to have a woman in an authority in the government, but yet she can't have authority in the church and the family, okay? That just doesn't flow very well. Uh, so, um, and the church does speak about women not being in authority in the government as well. So in those three areas, government, church, and family, women are not to be in authority. Voting, however, is something different because you're not exercising authority. You're actually exercising your uh, civil right, basically, to choose uh, who you want to be your authority, okay? Now, um, of course, in um, church, we don't vote for a bishop uh, or we don't vote for priests, okay? So that's out there, of course. They're elected by uh, the, the hierarchy themselves, and that's the way it should be because there are certain strictures that have to be followed there are certain characteristics of a church leader that have to be fulfilled in order for a man to be a bishop or a priest. And those are clarified for us by St. Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and other passages in the Bible. Okay, so that's my opinion, okay, that uh, women should be allowed to vote because that is not an exercise of authority, but an exercise of a civil right of being a citizen of a country. Okay, so um, that would be my uh, piece on that. But women's suffrage, as I said, is a wholly different thing. Um, you know, there is two sides to the story, however. There, are, there is the case where women, um, because they don't have authority, uh, can be in situations or, or find themselves in situations where those in authority over them, namely the men, abuse their authority, okay? And that is a dangerous place to be for a woman. Um, the mentality that some men have about women is also dangerous. And this was also part of the suffrage movement to to educate men to how they should view women, how they should respect women, was part of this whole idea of getting women out of the sort of barbarian age where they were considered a chattel and uh, mere possessions that could be traded and, you know, and um, they would be abused in society in certain ways and looked down upon or things like that. 
you know, that is wrong. It's all wrong. And if there's one person that came in human society to try to change that, that was Jesus. I mean, if you looked at, if you read the Gospels and you see the way he treated women, it was always, always with the utmost respect. Okay, even women who were caught in sin, like the adulterous woman, the, the respect with which he treated her and told her not to sin anymore and protected her from the hypocritical Pharisees. Um, you know, that was common in those days that the Pharisees would abuse these women and exploit them. And, um, um, you know, it was prevalent during that whole time. If there was anybody who tried to stop that, it was Jesus. And that's what men should do now. They should uh, stand up for women. Uh, and that only comes by respecting women. Um, these are, you know, as there's an old saying, he who rocks or she who rocks the cradle rules the world. And um, if a woman is given what she needs and taken care of and loved, uh, she becomes one of the best, um, one of the best examples, one of the best caretakers uh, that society could ever have. A lot of men just don't have that capability. They're too busy, you know, asserting themselves in the world and making a living to take time out to uh, rock that cradle. Although it doesn't mean they shouldn't, you know, there, there should be a tender side to men, a gentle side that uh, uh, tries to live out that kind of uh, uh, behavior for the sake of the children. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, a, a, that's why they're called gentlemen. You know, that word that we use for, for men, we call them gentlemen. Why gentle? Well, because the natural tendency for men is to be rough and tough. And, you know, in a, in a dog-eat-dog world, um, they need uh, to be to have a softer side, okay? And uh, as long as they don't become effeminate, uh, they can have a softer side. And, and that's what society needs. So <clears throat> in that kind of environment, uh, women flower. They grow. When they're respected and loved, they flower and grow. And then they, in turn, give that love to their children. And society can function very well, you see. So uh, men have to play their part. And that's why St. Paul in uh, Ephesians chapter 5 says to the men, husbands, love your wives. Husbands, love your wives. Which implies, of course, that there's a tendency for them not to love their wives. If there's any fault that men have, it's to take advantage of their wife or take her for granted and um, not treat her with the love and respect that she deserves as a woman, okay? And <clears throat> the woman, on the other hand, of course, has the problem of not submitting to her husband, you know? Uh, she may feel that her husband has too many faults or doesn't do things right or whatever the case may be. And, and of course, that all comes out after a few years of marriage, uh, where the woman sometimes has a little bit more, you know, um, uh, better ways of doing things or better ways of thinking about things and wishes her husband, you know, would be the same as her, and he may not be. And so she has problems submitting to him. Well, that doesn't mean you're, you shouldn't submit, okay? It should mean you, you should try to help your husband be the person he should be and let him know that you're willing to submit to him, but you're looking for him to be a good leader as well, okay? And there's nothing wrong with husbands and wives talking about that. After all, they live together. They're one body. They have to function together as one unit, okay? But ever since the Garden of Eden, you know, uh, women have had that problem, and so that's why St. Paul comes in and says twice, actually, in that passage, that women are to submit to their husbands, okay? So we each have our faults and our problems, and Paul takes care of that in that passage. 
men are to love their wives, women are to submit to their husbands. And uh, again, that's how a, a society will function best. Okay, and I, I did mention the Garden of Eden, and I and I should uh, go into that just a little bit because some people misunderstand um, what actually happened there. But what happened was that, as you know, the devil approached Eve, and so basically he's avoiding the person who's in authority. That's Adam. Not to say that Adam is going to, you know, did the best job himself, but, you know, the, the devil attacked the woman and she basically conceded to the devil. And then she, you know, gave this information or this new information to her husband and got him to, uh, to fall and not do his duty. His duty should have been to stop the devil in his tracks and say no to Eve because he was in authority. And we should also know this, theologically, it wasn't when Adam, I'm, I'm sorry, it wasn't when Eve sinned and took of the, uh, the apple or the fruit to eat. I'm just assuming it was an apple, who knows what it was. Uh, it was when Adam took of the fruit to eat that the God came down and um, gave the punishment, okay? Prior to Adam eating the fruit, uh, he had the opportunity, basically, to stop this whole thing in its tracks. And what he should have done is bring Eve to God and basically explain what happened. And then, uh, and that's what he should have done as a leader of his family and God would have taken care of the rest. What he would have done to Eve, who knows? Uh, but things would have been quite different, I believe, because if Adam hadn't eaten the fruit and disobeyed God's command, then there would be no, um, what we would call the, um, the headship, uh, because of Adam's headship, then the sin would not be, um, um, cast down to his progeny, okay, because he, he would have stopped it. And that would have been, as I said, his job as the leader of his family, as the authority in his family. So that's why when I said yesterday, when we talk about the authority of the husband, we're talking about a legal authority, okay? And so Adam had legal authority over Eve. And this was true and you'll find a lot of theologians today, modern theologians, who say, "Well, the sin of um, the sin that, or the results of the sin of Adam eating the fruit, uh, were that um, that uh, he would be in charge now of women, that he would be the authority," implying that before the sin in the Garden of Eden, that Adam and Eve were on equal footing, legally speaking, and none had authority over the other. That's totally false, okay? Totally false. And you'll find a lot of modern, in Catholic theology today, you'll find a lot of that. And uh, I don't know where they're getting it from, but that it's false. One reason we know why is in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13, St. Paul says that the man has authority over the woman because he was first formed, okay? That's the first reason he gives for why men have authority over women. Adam was first formed, okay? Now, we don't find that in Genesis, okay? But we do find it in St. Paul, and he's inspired by the Holy Spirit to write this, okay? So that's where it comes from. And so now we see why St. Paul was so adamant in his epistles that uh, men are in authority over women, because Adam was first formed, and then Eve, okay? Then he gives a second reason why Adam is in authority over Eve, and that is because the woman was deceived, not the man, 
okay? So that's the second reason, but that's a secondary reason. It's not the primary reason. The primary reason is because Adam was first formed. And so we have to abide by that. So in the Garden of Eden, then we know that Adam is in authority, okay? And the punishment that is given to Eve, it says, uh, and you shall desire your husband and he shall rule over you. Okay, actually in the Hebrew, it could be better said, uh, you shall desire to rule over your husband, but he shall rule over you. Okay, and and we we know this from the Hebrew grammar because in um, the Genesis chapter four, when we have the incident of Cain and Abel, um, the Lord says to Cain, "Sin is at the door, crouching at the door, and it desires to rule over you." Okay. That's the same grammatical structure that we find in Genesis chapter 3 when God is talking to Eve, okay? So you put us all together and you come out with your desire shall be not because the, the word desire has an object. It's not your desire shall be to your husband. It's it has, the desire has an object and thus your desire shall be to rule over your husband. That's what it means, okay? And so what does this tell us? Well, it tells us that, uh, you know, she, she doesn't like being in subjection to her husband. That would be the basal nature of a woman, not to be ruled over by the man. But God had ordained this because you can't have two authorities, okay? Because then you're just going to have chaos. One has to rule over the other. And the way God ordained it was he made Adam first to be the ruler and then made Eve as his helpmate. Okay, that's the way it was ordained. And that's the only way it's going to work. Okay, it's like God's not just ordaining it because, you know, it, you know, let's just try this experiment out. Now, he knows that this is the only way it's going to work. So uh, we can see that because Eve usurped Adam's authority, basically, and took it upon herself to confront the devil, um, this shows a tendency that she um, wants to take things on her own, okay, <laughs> without the man's uh, input or even his final decision. And um, so that started the whole thing off, and that's why the passage says, your desire shall be to rule over your husband, but he shall rule over you. And so in that sense, yeah, the um, reaffirmation of Adam's authority is the result of Eve's sin. But we can't say that the uh, original plan of God was to have both an authority, okay? And, that, and then because of the fall, Adam's now an authority over Eve. That's the wrong way to look at it, okay? What we want to say is that Adam had authority over Eve. And then after the fall, this, this uh, arrangement of God is um, accentuated. It's reinforced, okay, so that Eve knows that basically God's watching now. And uh, though she may have this, this desire to rule, it will not be fulfilled. Adam will continue to rule over her. And, you know, maybe the fact that women have been uh, oppressed and disrespected in society, um, the natural consequence of the fall has led to that state, sadly, okay? But that doesn't make it right. Um, we should always, as I said before, be trying to uplift women, to respect women, to love women. They are the cornerstone of our society. Those uh, children that we have come from women and they're only going to be good children and make us as proud fathers if we treat our wife with love and respect and she can then in turn give that to her children if she's not love and respected she's going to be in a bad situation and not be able to fully love and care for her children so men it all depends on you okay it starts with you uh, love and respect your wives, and I'll tell you that you'll have many, many, many happy returns. 
from that situation. All right, so as usual, I went on a little tangent on that one, but I think it was well worth it. All right, so uh, some other people have joined us tonight. Uh, Jose, Francisco, Suzanne, Victor, and Victor has a question, and that is, as far as I know, most textual criticism scholars believe the stoning story, St. Mary Magdalene, didn't, didn't take place. I disagree because I don't believe the Holy Ghost would let that passage to be so popular for so long. So shouldn't we trust only the Vulgate since this historical archeological method leads us sometimes to absurd, absurd ones like the one I just mentioned? Well, that's a big question there, Victor. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you. <coughs> Swallowed something wrong there. Um, that gets into the whole area of textual criticism, okay? So, but let me um, deal with some of the things you mentioned here. The Vulgate is just a translation, okay? It's not an inspired text, so that wouldn't even be in the running. Uh, the, the only time you would attribute this passage to the Vulgate is in the Vulgate's decision to keep the passage as a legitimate biblical inspired passage uh, in its translation. Okay, so that's the merit of the Vulgate in that sense, and I think that's what you're trying to say. So <clears throat> now there were other translations, of course, that kept John chapter 8 as a legitimate text of the inspired biblical revelation okay uh, but the vulgate led the way because basically it was the only translation around for you know over a thousand years um we only had the uh, hebrew and greek text as the originally inspired text of the bible and the vulgate was the only translation in the latin of those original biblical texts so in that sense, and I think you're saying this also, that the Vulgate held a lot of weight, okay? Now, um, but the Vulgate had to make a decision based on what was available to them. And even in the Vulgate's day, you know, so we're talking about early first millennium, there were various texts that did not contain um, John chapter 8. Okay, um, so so it, the Vulgate itself wasn't working in a pristine environment where all the texts agreed and there were no texts that disagreed. Okay, there were some. Um, now, I don't, I don't remember the text offhand, um, but um, if you take... <clears throat> Codex um, Sinaiticus from the 4th to the 5th century and Codex Vaticanus. Okay, these, these were the Greek manuscripts discovered by Tischendorf in the 1800s. <clears throat> and they are very valuable manuscripts. I mean, they, they are copies of um, ancient Greek manuscripts prior to them. And since they come from the 4th and 5th century, now the reason I mention these is because, if I remember correctly, uh, Codex Sinaiticus and Vaticanus don't contain John chapter 8, at least verses 1 to 12, okay? Um, then you have another one, Alexandrinus, around in the 5th century. Um, I'm not sure whether it contained it or not. You know, I, 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 what I, I would like to prepare to... Um, let me see if I can just get my, uh, I don't know what I did with it. Here it is up here. Hold on one second. I get my, uh, my Greek um, Bible that has all the passages that have been accepted by um, various Greek texts and not accepted. 
And uh, let me just see while we're while we're on while we're talking about this. Okay. Okay. So we have. Um, okay. So the passage in view here is um, John chapter seven verse fifty three to John chapter eight verse eleven. That's the passage you're talking about. That just so happens to cover the uh, woman in adultery. Okay, so um, most of the um, the large uh, lettered manuscripts, what we call uncials, um, contain this, and a lot of minuscules do. Uh, the Coptic version does, as I said, uh, more than the Vulgate. There, there is more than the Vulgate. The Syriac version has it. The Armenian version has it. So there were a lot of other translations that that contain this passage. Okay, um, but here's here's the problem, <laughs> and I, I'm just remembering it now. Um, whereas Codex, Codex Sinaiticus, Vaticanus, and Alexandrinus don't have it, um, Papyrus 66 and Papyrus 75 don't have it either. Okay, now this is where it gets a little hairy because the papyri are long before uh, Codex Sinaiticus and Vaticanus were written. The papyri were the earliest copies of the original autographs of the uh, New Testament. And P, uh, Papyrus 66 and 75 are two of the most famous. Okay, so if they don't have it, what went wrong? Okay. In other words, the earliest copies, two of the most famous earliest copies don't have it. Uh, so, you know, you have to use your judgment there. And then it's going to take a lot of internal study of the text to see, and, and some uh, scholars say, well, maybe it's not so much that this passage of the woman caught in adultery shouldn't be there, but it's in the wrong place. Some have said that. And so that would make it still part of the inspired text, but just not in John chapter 8. Okay. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, things you got to think about. You just can't say that, well, because the Vulgate has it in it, that means it's correct. Okay. Um, that's just not scholarship. Okay. That's basically favoritism by saying that, you know, because it's in this translation and that's the official translation of the church, that means this is true. Now, mind you, I believe that the Vulgate was correct in its decision, but it made its decision based on internal factors, not based on the fact that you know, Papyrus 66 or Papyrus 75 didn't have it, all right? I'm sure, you know, when Jerome was looking at this, uh, he might have known that these Papyri didn't have it, and yet he accepted it anyway, based on internal factors. And the internal factors are, of course, that the, the passage is, sounds legit. You know, there's really nothing in the passage that would, you know, cause one to stir and say, wow, that doesn't sound like the Bible. You know, it doesn't sound like something Jesus would do. It's quite the opposite. You know, this is exactly what Jesus would do from what we know of him. And so that's internal evidence there. And then what they would do is they would go in and examine the word usage that John uh, used in John chapter 8. And they would see if the, that word usage is similar to other words that he used in the Gospel of John. And if they turn out to be the same, well, again, you have internal evidence that this passage, John chapter 8, is consistent with how John wrote the other parts of his Gospel. Okay? 
Uh, and they do this in textual criticism. They'll go down to the very word and see if this word has been used by the author elsewhere. And if not, then it might be suspect of being spurious. Okay. So, but when all is said and done, when you've analyzed all the evidence, and even though you have these manuscripts that differ, all the evidence points to the fact that this is part of the Bible. Okay. And um, in light of the fact that the Holy Spirit is guiding the church, okay, to at least know what comprises Scripture, uh, that is probably the biggest weight behind the decision to keep John 8 in the Gospel of John. Because, as I think you implied in your uh, question, uh, who is in control of all this? Okay, that leads to a bigger question of how do we even know what the canon of the Bible is? You know, I mean, we have this thing called the Bible. Who decided uh, what books belong in the Bible? And, you know, they didn't really decide that question. You know, I mean, that question was up in the air for about 300 years. All right. We had, they had what they believed and was passed down to them as the Bible, but there were 200 other books competing. Uh, when I say, not that the book itself competes, but there were people who were promoting these books that ended up not being part of the Bible when the church finally made their decision. But prior to that decision, uh, these people, and some of them were our fathers, okay, promoting these books as part of the Bible. Let's say the Gospel of Thomas, okay, or the Book of Adam and Eve. Or, there's 200 of those, and we call them the pseudepigrapha books. Pseudo meaning false, pigrapha meaning writings. The pseudepigrapha books and the apocryphal books, okay? So you had a whole slew of these things that the church had to sort out. And so, the, but the final question is, when they finally sorted it out and they only chose 27, of these books, how in the world are they going to know that they got it right? Well, there's only one way. There's only one way. The Holy Spirit led them to sort these books out, and when the final decision came, it was an infallible decision by the church. Okay? Now, even that gets a little hairy, too, because uh, as Catholic theology teaches, we didn't have the infallible decision of which books belong in the Bible until the Council of Trent in 1563. So that's at least 1,500 years after the New Testament was written. Okay, that's a long time. All right. What we do know, however, is at the first council uh, in Rome, the Council of Rome in 380 AD, the same 27 books that we have today uh, were decided by the Pope at the Council of Rome in 380, okay? And then in uh, 319, at the Council of Carthage, although a local council, that same 27 book uh, uh, decision was uh, affirmed again, okay? And then in 787, at the count, Second Council of Nicaea, same thing reaffirmed again, same 27 books. And then at the Council of Florence in 1440, same thing. That same 27-book uh, New Testament was affirmed. But it wasn't infallible yet, okay? And this is how the church works. She may not make something infallible until, you know, a millennium after. <laughs> you would think that it would be needed, okay? Um, but the church, the church will make her infallible decision when she's actually forced to the wall. I mean, to to put it bluntly, uh, she's got so many things to deal with that she will deal with the hottest potato, let's so to speak, at the time. And in fifteen in the fifteen hundreds, uh, the it became a hot potato, the canon of scripture, because. On the Protestant side, we had Martin Luther 
saying that seven books of the New Testament shouldn't be there. You know, James, Hebrews, Revelation, blah, blah. Uh, and on the Catholic side, we had Cardinal Cajetan saying the same thing. Okay? So it, it wasn't actually a, a Protestant issue. It was a Catholic and Protestant issue. So it became even more necessary for the church to address this issue finally. And, you know, since the, the church was having a council dealing basically with justification and the sacraments at the Council of Trent, you know, let's tackle the canon as well and put this thing to bed before it blows up in our face. And so they sat down and made the final decision, the infallible decision. And the infallible decision basically says there will be no more discussion of this issue. We have made our final decision and it, it is over. This issue is over. So you couldn't even contest it, you know, by opinion anymore. Okay, because the church had made a final decision. But again, that took 1,500 years to, to come to. Okay. So, um, and, and, and another good reason why that might have happened was because let's say somebody found another book of the Bible. You know, there are a few candidates out there that, uh, they're no they're longer candidates, but they were candidates prior to the infallible decision in 1563, and that is, say, the, the epistle to the Laodiceans, okay, or 3rd Corinthians. Those books were out there, okay, and they look legit. And, um, but let's say we found some other books of the Bible, and the Spirit moved us to say that, hey, this is part of the Bible. It should be added to the Bible. Well, the way the church looks at it is we've looked at this long enough. We've looked at this for 1,500 years, and we are pretty sure that there is no more books be, to be added to, to the Bible, and we're also sure that there is no books to be taken away from the Bible. And therefore, we can make this infallible decision and set it in stone for, for all time, okay? But the glory of the Catholic Church is that the Spirit had already led them, evidently, to accept these 27 books for the New Testament early on in its history. And the Church kept using them. Everybody believed that that was the Bible. And the only time that there would be a fuss about it was when, you know, in the 1500s, you got these two people contesting it for some odd reason, whatever the reasons were, okay? Uh, and so here's how the tradition works, and it's beautiful. The Council of Trent says, all right, we're the council with the authority to make this infallible, but we're not going to go against the tradition. The tradition gave us these books. That means the Holy Spirit led us to accept these books. And if the tradition says that, and this tradition was passed down from the apostles, apostolic oral tradition, and was given to the church, then by golly, that's the truth. And so since we have the power, we're going to make that traditional truth infallible. So you see how it all hangs together. The Council of Trent really couldn't go against their tradition, okay? That's not their prerogative. Only unless there was some overwhelming evidence, but nothing came forth, you see. And so that's why she could feel confident to make it infallible. Again, I, I went off on a whole tangent there, but um, I, I hope you uh, get a better sense of how those things fit together for John chapter 8. All right, Susan says, limbo for miscarried aborted babies, still a thing, or will they ever be able to see the beatific vision in heaven? Well, Susan, this is one of those things that they haven't decided on yet, okay? So now what? We've been 2,000 years uh, on this issue, and still the church has not come down, dogmatically speaking, okay? And it's interesting, you know, limbo... Uh, you know, that's the Latin word for margin, okay? 
So you know, it's like a piece of paper and you have you know, lines around the paper, that's the margin of the paper. Everything that is within the margin, let's analogously call that the church, everything outside the margin uh, is outside the margin and, and that's what the church called limbo. <laughs> okay, it was called limbus, the mar outside the margin, because the church really didn't know what to do with them. Okay, and and that still remains the case today. There has been no dogmatic statement about it. Now, the church can lean toward one view or the other. Okay, and there have been opinions about which way the church should lean, but you know. To answer your question, no, there has been no definitive statement uh, on that very issue. Okay, why God has kept it that way, you know, why the Spirit has, you know, maybe the Spirit uh, feels in His vast intelligence that it's not for the church to know. Okay, and I think that's the decision that that we have to accept. That the Holy Spirit says it's not for the church to know. This is God's domain. This is God's domain, and I'm perfectly satisfied with that, okay, because it's Christ's church. It's not our church, all right? We just take what's given to us, and that's what's been given to us, and we have to be honest about that. And it doesn't mean, you know, that somehow the system is faltering because we haven't figured it out yet. It just means that uh, with the tradition, and with the movement of the Holy Spirit, we just do not have a definitive statement yet. And uh, I think, again, the reason would be because we're not meant to know. That's God. Salvation is God's realm. Okay? Um, you know, there's a lot of people going around saying who's saved and who's not saved and this and that. The thing I always say, look, you know, you better watch out what you're saying. Because... You know, it's, it's like Jesus told the Pharisees, you know, you compass land and see to make one proselyte, and when you're done, you make him twofold a child of hell. Or, you know, you, you are so concerned about getting to the kingdom of heaven that you stop everyone else from getting to the kingdom of heaven, he also told them, okay? Because they're so concerned about who's saved and who's not saved, you know, who's doing the, the right things to be saved, who's, do, who's not. All right. The church decides those things when it's, you know, appropriate to do. This is not something we want to air in public, you know, saying he's saved or he's not saved or, or whatever. Salvation is God's prerogative. He's the giver and the taker. He's the one that gives life and death. And so we should leave many of these things in his hands. You know, the same thing is true for um, when we talk about the encyclical by Pius the Ninth, uh, uh, Quanto is for short, you know, where he said that if a person is not baptized and yet lives a moral life, he can, he can attain eternal life. Okay. Well, there's a lot of people out there that don't like that because they're so high and mighty on baptism from the way they interpret uh, chapter 4, Session 6 of the Council of Trent, that um, they think that without baptism, there is no possibility that someone can be saved. Okay? Well, the church hasn't really said that. I mean, Pius IX came out and said that even though he might not have baptism, God may work it out another way. All right? Which way that is, I don't know. Okay? All I know is what the Pope taught. That's what he taught, and I'm no more going to throw that under the rug than I would throw anything else under the rug, okay? So, um, you know, we got to be careful there, too. Baptism is required. That's what we teach. But in those cases where someone can't be baptized, does that mean they can't be saved? Well, that's God's decision, not our decision. He will figure that out, okay? He's the one who gave the doctrines, and he will use them as best he can for each situation. And uh, so, again, we got to be very careful there. Okay, Gage says, um, is there any difference between sanctification and purification in reference to purgatory? 
the sanctification continue in purgatory? Could you be fully sanctified when you die, but still need to undergo temporal punishment? All right, so let's tackle this one at a time here. Is there any difference between sanctification and purification in reference to purgatory? Well, there is because we don't use the word sanctification in reference to purgatory. All right, that's just not in the nomenclature. Sanctification is a term used for Christians on earth. Uh, sanctification basically meaning we're set apart and we are holy. Okay, so um, that just doesn't apply to a person in purgatory. Purification, yeah, because he has to be purified from sins that have not been adjudicated. All right. But that's not what sanctification is. So that's why we don't use the term there for purgatory. Um, does sanctification continue in purgatory? No. Okay. Uh, purification does, not sanctification. Could you be fully sanctified when you die but still need to undergo temporal punishment? <laughs> Depends on what you mean by fully sanctified. Okay. In the biblical usage of the term, sanctified again means set apart, okay? Um, you're sanctified when you're baptized, okay? And you're still sanctified when you commit venial sin, all right? The only time that you're not set apart, you're not holy, is when you commit mortal sin. That separates you from God. So to answer your question, uh, you can be sanctified and still be a venial sin. And what is venial sin? require? Well, it requires purification, and that will take place in purgatory. Okay, so I think that, that answers your question. All right. Um, Jay Gage says, I was, this, he's referring to last night, he says, I was referencing First Peter chapter 2, verse 8, and it says, they stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. Okay, so let's look at that passage. First Peter. That's in the New Testament, right? First Peter chapter two. Verse eight. Let me read that. Again. All right. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto they were appointed. Okay, let me just take a, take a look at the Greek here, uh, Gage, and then I'll get right back to you. A stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, who stumble at the word, disobeying. Okay, so, all right, to... All right, so the only thing I would say here, uh, Gage, is that what this is referring to is the same thing that Paul talks about in Romans chapter 1, um, verses 24 and onwards, where he says that they exchange the relations between man and women for relations between men and men, and women likewise do the same exchanging the relation between man and woman to have relations between woman and woman, okay? Um, and then later in that passage, it says that God gave them up. God gave them up to their lusts, okay? So what, the, what does this mean? Well, normally, if we fall into sin, the grace of God will help lead us out of sin. Okay, that, we call that congruent grace in Catholic theology. Okay, so the, the theology says we cannot do anything without God's grace. Okay, even when we are not Christian, the thing that makes us want to do good is not coming from ourselves but it's coming from God's grace, which we call congruent grace. Uh, it's called congruent because 
basically the grace works with our free will. Okay, so we, we let's say we're praying for somebody. We say, I pray to God that you will save them. So what God will do is he will give them his congruent grace. And that will stimulate, that will move the person toward the good. Okay, now that person also has a free will, whether he's going to accept that congruent grace that God gives them and act upon it. Okay, and most of the time, what do we find? They don't act upon it. Okay, very few of them actually become saved. I mean, I've prayed for many, many, many people, and very few of them have become saved. But the fact is, some do. Okay, those are the, those are the people that have acted with their free will on the grace that God gives. Because, as I said before, everything revolves around man's free will. The whole reason this universe was made the way it is is because man has free will. It's like the pivot point of everything, from the Garden of Eden onward. Okay. You have to understand that. God will not impose himself against your free will. Okay? So that's very important to know. Um, but with these people in Romans 1, for example, and this person here in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 8, um, they have basically, have, they now have a seared conscience. They are in... A heinous mortal sin with no uh, reprieve whatsoever. They will continue to do this. Matter of fact, the more you try to get them out of it, the more they will go into it. Okay? You can reach a point like that. New Testament's very clear about that. That uh, once you have decided that you're, uh, and, and you continually show this, that you have you want none of what God has to offer, then God will withdraw his grace. And if he does that, you're doomed. Because that means you have no impetus to repent of your sin. And that's what's happening to these people in Romans chapter 1. When it says God gave them up to their lust, that means God withdrew his spirit and allowed the sin to manifest itself. And that's why they're as bad as they are. That's why when you see the parades down, uh, you know, uh, Broadway if it, in San Francisco, and you see all these, you know, people dressed up in drag, and I mean, you, it's just absolutely disgusting to watch. Well, they're people that basically have been given up to their own lust. The grace of God has been withdrawn. That's why they act the way they do. And believe you me, if God did the same thing to you or me, we'd act the same way. Okay? It's only by the grace of God that we don't go down that path. The only thing we have to attribute to ourselves, and, you know, some credit is the fact that we used our free will to accept God's grace. Okay? And, and, and therefore, you know, we, we deserve something. Not in the sense that God owes us anything, but you know, we have accepted because we've obeyed God with our free will, and God will bless us for that, okay? But these are the people that have chosen not to, to go that way, all right? And uh, that's the reason why, you know, Peter uses a strong language here, that they were destined to because God gave up on them, okay? We also have the uh, sin against the Holy Ghost, okay? Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Now, Jesus says, you know, all sins can be forgiven, but not that one. Okay. And why is that? Well, if you look at the context of that, I think it's in Mark chapter 3, uh, what's happening there is Jesus just performed a stupendous miracle right in front of the Pharisees. And you would, you know, you would think, what is it about Jesus that we're supposed to accept him coming as a man what convinces us, if we were back in those days, that he is who he says he is? Okay? Anybody can come along and say, hey, I'm Jesus. And there were a lot of people doing it in those days. What sets Jesus apart that we're more or less required, we're compelled to believe in him? 
Well, that's because of his miracles. Okay? That's why the miracles were given. Because we know instinctively that raising someone from the dead or turning water into wine, which requires creation because water doesn't have carbon in it, wine does. So he had to create the carbon to unite with the hydrogen and oxygen to make the wine, okay? Uh, or someone who can put limbs back on people. You know, here's a guy without an arm, and Jesus puts his arm back on him. Or someone who can't see, and now he sees instantaneously. Uh, or raising from someone from the dead, as I said. You know, I mean, these are stupendous miracles. These are miracles that you can't say, well, you know, they're shy. They're just a magician's trick or something like that. No. Okay. When you see a limb put back on someone's body who didn't have it the day before, there's something different about this person. Okay? So when he claims he's the son of God, you have all the more reason to believe him. Okay? So in this chapter, Jesus does this stupendous miracle, and the Pharisees come back and say, well, he just does that by the power of Beelzebub, the prince of the demons. <laughs> you ever seen something, some people so obstinate in your life? Okay. You see, the Pharisees made their decision. They made their decision. They aren't going to accept this guy, Jesus, whatever he does. All right? They made their decision. Their consciences were seared. God gave them up, as I said about the people in Romans 1. Okay? They were gone. All right? And so in refusing to accept Jesus for who he was, who he said he was, in the face of this stupendous miracle, Jesus turns around and said, all sins can be forgiven except blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. First of all, they were saying, in so many words, that Jesus was under the power of the devil instead of the Holy Spirit. Okay? And that's the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Saying that though Jesus is obviously moved by the Holy Spirit, you're going to say that he's moved by the devil. Okay? Black and white, all right? That sin can't be forgiven. Why? Well, because they've totally turned themselves over to evil, okay? And, and, and you need that information about the Pharisees as you go and read the rest of the Gospels, because at every turn, they try to trap Jesus, and they can't trap him every time he gets out of it by his wit, just telling the truth, basically, but he uses it in a special way, okay? And so you get to the end, like uh, the end of the Gospels, and they're just desperate. They're just desperate. And so they come up with the final solution. Well, obviously, we can't trap this guy, so we're going to have to kill him. You see, that's someone who has who the grace of God has been totally withdrawn. He's just allowing them to act out who they are in their inner essence without any restraint of good whatsoever. Okay? That's what that's all about there. And uh, God forbid that we would ever fall into that trap. But it's certainly possible for anybody, not just the Pharisees, okay, and that should make a shudder in our boots. Um, you know, this is, this is real life. This is for all the marvels. Uh, and, and we only have one chance to do it. That's, that's this life. Okay? So, a uh, long way around that question, I know, of course. Uh, it looks like I'm over time. So, Mav... Um, has a question about the Nephilim, and Phil has a question about the sacrament of confession. Gage has another question. Gage, I'm, I'm going to start charging you, Gage. Okay. Uh, Lawrence says, hi. How you doing, Lawrence? 
I sent you two books today, by the way. Um, Manny wants to know my opinion of Pope Francis. Um, not good. How's that? Uh, Jordan has a question. Manny has another question. So, all right. So we, uh, I'll, I'll try to save these questions for next week. Okay. I want to print these out, save them for next week. And if I don't remember them, uh, bring them back and, and ask me and I'll deal with each of them. And as you can see, I don't shy away from any question. Any question you want to ask me, uh, I will answer, okay, as best I can. So um, but that'll be about it for tonight. All right, it's been nice being with you, and hope to see you again next week, which would be September the 24th, Tuesday, and the 25th. And also, uh, for those of you interested in science, tomorrow, We'll be on the principal Facebook page, and uh, we'll answer all your science questions there, and uh, that'll be for an hour. Okay? So until then, we will see you. God bless you.